I want to give a hearty and strong thank you to both Brian and Elijah for their inspiring and uplifting singing tonight and leading us with many voices joined together with such beautiful singing. I know preachers love to uh, get up and preach and follow after beautiful and zealous singing like we had tonight, and I know that uh, Steve appreciates that as well. I also want to thank all of you who are here tonight. Uh, we are at the end of the third day of Focal Point of 2024. We have been blessed so far with many great lessons and insights and encouragements, and uh, it just, just seems like it gets better and better every single day. We had great fellowship today, which is always appreciated, wonderful studies, great food with uh, Andrew and his crew bringing the fajitas in. It was beautiful. Um, we, we truly are a blessed congregation here at university to be able to host Focal Point, um, not just because it is an opportunity to meet people from other places, but many of our members are able to be here during the day, uh, many more even at night and each of them are strengthened and encouraged as well right along with the rest of you who are visiting with Focal Point. I'm blessed to have my mother here and uh, all week long she's been coming up to me and with, with the biggest smile on her face, walking on cloud nine and on her phone. Every once in a while I get on there and update it but she's got little app icons and it says Steve Higginbotham. So if today she wants to listen to Steve, she hits Steve. Or it says Eric Owens, and she goes and hits Eric Owens. She's got to flip through a few pages, and there's a Sam Dilbeck button somewhere at the end that she, she'll hit every once in a while. But it takes it straight to their sermons on their web church's websites. And, uh, and then she comes here, and she tells me, she says, I feel like I know them already. She's not met one of them, but she knows them all because she loves to hear them. We are blessed to have Steve Higginbotham with us tonight. He is from the Carnes Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, where he has served for 14 years. Uh, he has preached for 40 years. As young as he is, he's already preached 40 years. And um, he, he just, I said, what, what should I say about you? And he said, just tell him I'm married up. And um, I think there's a lot of preachers who amen that. They have four kids and two grandkids. And uh, he is, the lesson's title is to sum it all up from 1 Peter 4. 8 through 12. But before he comes to speak to us, uh, we're going to be led in a song by Brian, and then uh, Patrick Gooch, one of our, our members here, will be leading us in an opening prayer, and then it'll be Steve's turn to preach. This song is not in the book, but it is another four-part four song like Magnificat earlier. We'll start with the altos and the bass and the tenor. And then the soprano, and then we'll sing it all together, just like we did the last one. Love one another.
Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us today and for the lessons that we've heard and for the fellowship that we've had with one another. Thank you for the speaker tonight and for the time that he has spent studying your word to prepare this lesson for us. And may it be beneficial to all those who hear. Watch over us as we depart and we'll keep us safe. And it's in your son's name we pray. I know I have said this before, and you've probably heard it before, but I know it's Tuesday, and you've been all day yesterday and all day today, and, and it's really easy to be tired by this time in the week. And I want to remind you, I mean, uh, we, we have several younger preachers here, and this is a preacher training uh, uh, workshop, and uh, there was a preacher, a young preacher, that was preaching and just had started, and he noticed that uh, about in the middle of his sermon, people just lost attention or he lost their attention and that disturbed him and and he didn't know what to do to get uh, get it back everybody's head was down and and so he went on vacation he saw an older preacher was preaching at this congregation that he attended and he looked around and he saw the same thing was happening to them and he thought well at least it's not just me but right as he had that thought that older preacher said the best years of my life have been spent in the arms of another man's wife Man, I got everybody's head to come up. Everybody's head pops up, and then he said, my mother, and went on and finished the sermon. He had everybody's attention, and that young preacher thought, man, that is so good, and he reached for a pen to write it down. He didn't have the pen, but he said, I I'll remember that, and so he went back home a couple weeks later. Same thing happened. Everybody was gone, and so he decided to try it, and he said, the best years of my life have been spent in the arms of another man's wife. And every head popped up, he got their attention, and he said, and for the life of me, I can't remember who she was. <laughs> uh, don't, stick with me tonight, don't get me into that situation. But I would appreciate that. I wanna thank you for having me here. This is a great event and has been going on for a lot, long time, and I know it involves a lot of work by a lot of people. And I want you to know that that is very much appreciated and not overlooked. And uh, you're to be commended for all that you're doing and for the encouragement that is found here and it's taken back elsewhere and other people benefit from it. So I just want to thank you for that. Uh, the topic tonight is to sum it all up. And uh, as I was thinking about that, you know, there are certain passages, well, certain things on Facebook that I see pop up on my account. Probably you have seen it too. Have you seen the, the advertisement for somebody? You, you write, a, you tell, you can write down about your wife or your husband, and you can tell about how you met and how old they are and, and tell about uh, some significant date that you had, and you, and you just write all these details down, and then they will take those details, and they have songwriters and singers who will write that into a poetic song and sing it, and, it, and so people record their spouses, you know, they're maybe in their car, and he set the phone up recording, and that song comes on the radio, and it, it kind of sounds familiar. You can see like the head pop up of the spouse and say, wait, that sounds a little bit like us. And then as it goes a little further, it's go, wait, that's, and then finally they're like, well, what is this? Who, what is this? How did you do this? And, and usually there's a lot of tears involved and all that kind of thing. But um, what I, when, when I read this passage, I kind of felt like, this is one of those things that is applicable to me as it was in the first century. And as I read this, I'm thinking, this is for us. This is too detailed to not be relevant. It had to have been written for the 21st century Christian. But I know that it was written with a particular people in a particular time and place in mind. But I'm telling you, it is as relevant today as it ever has been. The book of 1 Peter. And just a quick survey, if you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, you see the diaspora. 
and or the scattering that you read in in verse or chapter uh, one and verse one. That word is an interesting word. It, it used to describe the the dispersion diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews in the Old Testament when they were taken off into captivity. But that term evolved, and we see it referring to Jewish Christians in Acts chapter 8. But now Peter's talking about Christians as a whole. This term describes Christians who have scattered out in the world, and they're not in a little community of faith. They're not like the Essenes who all just huddled and stayed among themselves. They're living among people that don't believe in the God of heaven. And that presents unique problems. But that's where we are, right? That's exactly where we are. My neighbors aren't Christians. In fact, nearly my entire subdivision isn't Christians. And you can see that when you get up and go to church on Sunday. Nobody's going to church at all, hardly. Um, so the concerns that they had, they're the same concerns that we have, living dispersed among unbelievers. And then you look at chapter 2 and verses uh, 11 and 12, and you see the need to be an example to other people. There are unbelievers who need to see that we live a consistent life in harmony with the teachings of our master. The world needs to see that. Well, that's us too. We need to show that. And it's just as relevant to me as it was to them. And then you get to 2 Peter chapter 2, and verses 13 through 17, and then we have this government and uh, told to be uh, uh, followers of, of the government and be in submission to government. And one of the hard, I think it's hard because we live in a culture that permits free speech and we are allowed to voice our dissent. And that's good. I'm glad it's like that. But I think sometimes we... We are proud of our descent, but we give little attention to God about honoring the king and, and giving, uh, you know, being submissive to the powers that be. And, and that's a struggle for a lot of, a lot of Christians uh, living today to be subject to people that sometimes make laws that are not uh, pleasing to the Lord. We still have to respect them for the position that they hold. And then you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and, and you see um, marital relationships covered. Wives, win your husbands, if not by uh, the word, through your conduct. And then he talks about husbands. You know, dwell with your wives according to understanding, lest your prayers be hindered. Well, don't we, we have marital problems today. Our, our culture has so many divorces and we need to know how to manage the relationship within marriage. And then we read about the suffering of Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 3 um, and how that uh, that is to be an example for us. Not just a broad example. Uh, Eddie mentioned this this afternoon. We sometimes talk about, you know, walk in his footsteps and, and he's our example. Well, the context is his, he's our example in suffering. We are to suffer and endure with the same kind of endurance that Jesus endured. And that we are living in an ever-increasing culture that doesn't allow us the same uh, blessings or favors that we once possessed. And so uh, what happens when we suffer for our faith? The, the book is so relevant to us. It was written to us as much as it was to those first century Christians. But I want us to look in context and look at this idea of being, uh, uh, to sum it all up. And, and I, I started at verse 7 uh, because of the paragraph breaking, but I, I want you to look with me and read, and we'll, we'll talk about what it means to sum it up. And by the way, before we get to this, there are certain passages in the Scripture, and I like it that way, um, have you ever had, uh, if you've ever been a teacher, you know, in the school of preaching, they still do this. I remember it being done, and I probably did it when I was in school. But uh, you'll be teaching, and somebody will invariably raise their hand, and you say, yes. And they'll say, is this going to be on the test? Yeah. That aggravates the life out of me. It will be because you just asked the question. But, you know, what they're wanting to say is, if it's not, I'm not going to pay attention. 
But um, these are things that are relevant to us. And, and what we like to do, I like to just tell me in a nutshell. You know, if we condense it all down, what do we have? And the Bible does that. In the Old Testament, in the book of Micah, chapter 6 and verse 8, what did, what did Micah say? Here's what you're to do. Do justly, love mercy, and humble yourself or humbly follow your God. That's a good summary of what it means to be a child of God. Do right, love justice, and walk humbly with God. We see another example of it in, in Matthew chapter 22 when, when the rich ruler, or excuse me, the, the ruler, the lawyer, comes to Jesus and says, um, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Uh, basically gives him the Shema, Deuteronomy. And, and um he says, and I'll go further, and I'll tell you what the second greatest is. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is such a great summary of what it means to be a child of God. Love God and love your fellow man. I, I like those condensed versions. Um, did you ever use cliff notes when you are in college? Man, I lived off cliff notes. I had lit classes that I had to take in high school and in college, and I don't think I ever read a single book. But I read Cliff Notes, uh, Spark Notes, or whatever they're called, you know, today. But I would read those and get enough to get by uh, with. And, and God has given us some of these condensed versions. And this is a condensed version of what it means to be a Christian in 1 Peter chapter 4. And I'd like for us to look at this. Verse 7. He says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The end of all things is at hand. That may be troublesome to you or hard to understand. How can Peter say that the end of all things is at hand? And here we are 2,000 years later, and it still hasn't happened. Um, some have struggled with that and said, well, that kind of would throw off on the inspiration of, of Peter. And therefore, they, they, they struggle with that. Like, how can we say it's at hand and 2,000 years have passed? Well, I think it's at hand in this respect. I don't think it's at hand or Peter thought that it was at hand in reference to, like, it is coming tomorrow, so you better get ready. Now, it could have, but I don't think he was preaching the soonness of his return as much as he was the immediacy. It could happen at any moment. You see, they were living in the last days. The book of Acts, in chapter Acts, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, 1, Peter, or 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 1, it speaks of us living in the last days. There's nothing else coming. We are in the last days. The next thing that happens is going to be the coming of Jesus. And so it's next. There's nothing else coming in between. And so in that respect, it's near. We're toward the end of the book, and nothing else is coming. And so he says, in light of that, be serious and watchful in your prayers. If we believed that Jesus was coming tonight at 9 o'clock, I think there would be more people here in this building tonight. The excuses that people might have for not coming to church next Sunday, uh, if they believed that he was coming Monday morning, they'd probably be in church Sunday morning, and they would probably fill the pews in the front at the end of that sermon. If we were watchful and, and thinking that Jesus could return at any moment, it would make us behave better. Uh, you know, we're not willing to take some kinds of risks. And, and what allows us to take these sinful risks that we sometimes engage in is when we put that thought in the back of our mind. When you come to the realization, and it's in the forefront of your mind, that Jesus could come back at any moment, you're stronger. And we have the ability to withstand temptation. There is no temptation given to us that is not common to man, but God is faithful. 
not willing that any of us should be tempted above that we are able. We can do it. And I'll tell you what, being around the right people and having the right influence can make you really strong. Uh, I used to play a lot of ball uh, in the evenings and uh, at the YMCA, and we would play basketball, and, and eventually you, you lose and you sit down on the side of the court, and these guys will talk, and they'll say, um, what do you do for a living? And I'll say, I'm the preacher at you know, the church here, and they'll go, oh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that a little bit ago, you know, on the court. You know, they start apologizing for themselves. If, if you were with your elders for a day, would that change your behavior? Sure it would. You would be more concerned about how you spoke to your wife and your children and, and how you spoke when you're angry with your coworkers. When you put certain people around you, it helps you to be a better Christian. And Peter says, you need to remember that Jesus is near. And when we remember that, we'll be a better person. And, and I think there's an interesting aspect of this because he says not only be watchful, but he says to do it in prayer. Uh, how do we, how do we, how are we to be watchful in prayer? What, what does that mean? You know, when I think about that, I think, and you can maybe think of some other things, but one of the things that I would think of is that um, it has something to do with what John did in Revelation chapter 20. Come, Lord Jesus. He was ready to have it all wound up. And I know that that prayer is easier for some people to pray than others. If you're at the point in John's life that he was in, he was an older man, he was exiled to a, an island that was a difficult place, punishment, hard work, labor. He's ready to, he's ready to go home. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. But if you're 20 years old and you haven't lived your life yet and you haven't been married or maybe you just got married and you haven't had children and you want to work at your job that we, you've been training for, there are all these reasons that you might not want him to come yet because you have things yet to, to experience. And so your desire may not be as strong as somebody who's much older. But that desire for the Lord to come, you know, that creates some tension for some people to pray for the soon return of Jesus. Um, now, I know that there's a passage in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, or chapter 3, verse 12, that talks about how that we need to be watchful and we are hastening the coming of the Lord. How can you hurry up the coming? Can, do we have that power? Peter said we hasten the coming of the Lord. How can we do that? Well, I believe that the Lord has set a day. And, and I don't know that I could ever make that come faster because he's appointed a day in which he will judge. So what, what is it? He's appointed a day when Jesus will come back. No one knows but the Father. So if that day is appointed... How can we speed it up? I, I don't know that it's the concept of speeding it up. That, that Greek word there can mean to speed up, but it can also mean to long for. And I think that's the idea in this text, that we are to long for his coming. Uh, some translations, about a, uh, nearly a dozen of them that I looked at in preparing for this lesson, have that translated instead of hastening the coming, earnestly desiring or eagerly desiring or longing for the coming of Christ. But I'll tell you, it creates, it creates some tension. You see, there was a time in my life that I could very easily pray, Lord, come quickly. You know, just get us out of this fallen world. Kim and I are always telling, we, we turn on the television, and you can't even watch the commercials anymore without being offended. The, the, the commercials are bad. And whenever that happens, we'll look at each other and say, this world is not our home. You know, it's just out of frustration. Yes, Lord, come quickly. Take us to a better place. But as some of you know, you know, we, we have four children, but our oldest son has chosen to walk away from God. And that prayer becomes really hard to pray. 
Because if he did come back, what would that mean for my son? And so I, I, I hear what he's saying, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And, and that concept of longing for the Lord to come. And there's a part of me that please give more time. But I think that tension is resolved by faith in Christ. I trust him. He will do what's right. And, and I have absolute trust in him. And I will lay my life in his hands. And I think that's how that tension is, is resolved. But the first point is, as Christians, we should be people who are alert and looking for the return of Jesus. And if we do, and that's in the forefront of our mind, we will be a changed people and we will be more urgent about the task that the Lord has left us with, about trying to bring others to Christ. The second thing that I'd like us to look at is in verse 8. And above all these things, have fervent love one for another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Have fervent love one for another. But note what he said, above all things. Don't miss this. If you're going to miss something in Scripture, don't let it be this. This is the summit. Above everything, love each other. I've been places where I don't think Christians are doing that very well. In fact, when I visited, it's noted for its lack of love. And we're missing it, if that's it. If I enjoy fighting and scrapping with somebody and, and pinning their ears to the wall, if I enjoy that more than peace, I'm missing it. I, I like the Old Testament statement that was said of David. David is the giant slayer. He's a man's man. He killed Goliath. But you know how he's, he's described in the Psalms? As the sweet psalmist of Israel. The sweet psalmist of Israel. That doesn't sound very manly, does it? If it doesn't, it's because we don't understand what it means to be a man. He can be a strong warrior, a giant slayer, but he can also be the sweet psalmist of Israel. We need more sweet psalmists in the Lord's church today. Men who desire peace and who have concepts of love that spill out from them rather than looking for and shaking every bush trying to find something wrong with somebody. We, we need more of that in the church. Above all, love one another. And love covers a multitude of sins. There are a number of ways we can take that. Love covers a multitude of sins. Um, you know, Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 20, your enemies will reveal your sins, your friends will cover it. No one knows better my faults than my wife. So she has this body of information that she can just pour out and, and make you laugh and ridicule me. But what's she going to do with that information? I hope she's going to cover it, and I know she will, and I will hers as well. When we first married, we, there was a couple. We went out to eat to their house, and, man, it was verbal attack. It was like being at a tennis match. You just went like this, uh, and, and just these verbal barbs back and forth. And my wife and I got in the car after that dinner, and we sat down, and we, we got about a block away, hadn't said anything to each other. And then we said, let's never do that to each other. And we've pretty much kept that promise. We, we want to honor each other because we love each other. And we're not going to expose each other's faults. If you're going to get together and a bunch of guys and you're going to run down your wives and then you want me to chime in, I'm not going to do it. We've made this pact. And, and when Kim is around other people and, and you start talking about your husband, she's not going to do that either. 
I, I'm kind of a jokester, and so people will say, and I'm, I'm thinking of a thing we had at Carnes just not too long ago. Uh, a, a preacher came up, and, and I get this a lot. She gets this a lot. People will come to her and say, how do you live with him? You know, just like because I, I tease a lot. And that, how do you live with him? And I think everybody expects her to, to join in, and she refuses to do it. She said, I, I, I love living with him. I, you know, we, we, it's, it's not hard at all. And it just kind of, it takes, and literally that man stepped back and said, I don't even know what to do with that. And, and she, he was just dumbfounded, but that's how we've chosen to live. Love covers each other's faults. It doesn't expose them. That's not a kind thing to do. If you know bad things about another person, don't reveal that. I know a preacher who spent time in prison. Before he became a gospel preacher, he spent time in prison for an armed robbery that he was a participant in. <clears throat> I know his name, but I'm not going to tell you. Because how would that help you? That was a different person. He's not that anymore. And love demands that I cover that. But there's another sense in which love covers sin. And it's that God, his love for us, moves us to repent. And that repentance brings forgiveness. Um, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 <clears throat> says, The goodness of God causes men to repent. And, and when we see how good and loving God is, and Mike talked about that in one of those small classrooms this morning, I, I wish you could have heard his lesson, but um, that, that character of God can move people to change their lives. And his love can cause us to repent, which causes our sins to be covered. Let, let me tell you this too. Sometimes I hear people say, Christianity, ha, who wants to be a Christian? God's a killjoy. Jesus is a wet blanket. He won't let you have any fun. He's, he's just, you know, you can't do anything. Everything that's fun, he says no. And you can't do this and you can't do that. And, and they see Christianity in that way. And they say, that's why I don't like Christianity. Jesus is just some heavy, weight, burden on our shoulders. That's not the real reason. That's what you can say to make yourself look better and put the blame on Jesus. But you want to know why people find it hard to love Jesus? This is the true reason. Because Jesus demands that we love. And that's hard. You can't hold grudges. You can't get vengeance. You can't treat people unkindly. You see, that's the real rub with Jesus, is that he calls us to such a high and lofty standard of living that people aren't willing to do it. And their excuse and their justification for themselves is Jesus is a killjoy. No, what Jesus is calling you to do is love, and you don't have enough in you to love. That's the real reason. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Then look at the third thing he says in this nutshell to sum it all up. He tells us to be watchful. He tells us to love. And then he tells us to be hospitable. Look at verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Now, I think it's interesting. Be, do not, or, or be hospitable. When we think of hospitality today, we're talking about having somebody over for our house for dinner, and then they'll reciprocate with us, and, and that's hospitality. That's not really the meaning of that word. I know that's how we use it today, but that's not the meaning of it. It, it comes from a Greek word that literally, literally means a lover of strangers. To be hospitable, you're someone who loves a stranger, loves someone that's not in your immediate circle. Do you have a circle of friends that you do things with? What if somebody else is introduced that you don't know them? What if some visitor comes that you've never seen before and they, they show up at church and they have needs? What, what are you going to do? Are you Are going to run from them? But let somebody else deal with it. I don't know them. I don't know what they want. I don't know what, you know, it, it's real easy to push people away. And Peter's saying, don't be people who push people away. 
Love hospitality. Love strangers and meet their needs. And in the first century, much of that was keeping people who were traveling, Christians, that let them in your home. Are, are you people that will meet the needs of other people? And then here's, you know, we can say, yeah, yeah, I do that. But here's the catch. Without grumbling. Ooh, that's, that's the hard part. When I was preaching in Kentucky, we had a really good practice. When anybody in the family of one of our members died, we would offer our building to have a, a meal at the funeral, after the funeral. You know, many people have big families and they don't have room in their house to have everybody there. And we give them the building for a day and say, stay, visit, talk, we'll provide your food, stay out of your way and give you time to grieve and laugh together and visit. And it's a great ministry, but we have to fix some food. We have to set up tables. We have to set up chairs. And sometimes I would overhear conversations like, they said 45 people were coming and now we learned 50. We're gonna have to run out to KFC and get more chicken. I don't know what's, you know, and, and it's that kind of talk. That's not, that's not, hospitality God is a God who desires our heart we can go through the motions and it means nothing John 4 24 worship God if we are to worship him we must worship him in spirit and in truth and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and you see this if you give your body to be burned and you don't have love nothing it's just you're just making a noise it means nothing and we can do all kinds of really neat things in the name of Jesus and ruin it all by having a sour attitude I'll tell you and it comes easy and we may find ourselves in positions of service where we have to do things and, and then we're kind of grumbling about it. I got to keep this person for the lecture. We have our lectureship next week. We got to keep this person and, and we're going to have to do this and meals every night. And, you know, it, it's easy to do. But I'll tell you what you need to do Romans 12 and verse 2 be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We got to think differently, we got to check our thoughts. We've got to make sure that what we do is not disannulled or annulled by our poor attitudes. Be hospitable, but do it without grumbling. And then he says one more thing. Be a good steward. Look at verse 10. As each one has received a gift minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Whether these gifts were miraculous gifts or just the abilities and skills that we're born with and that we can do, um, it, it matters not. The point is, and you can read first, uh, Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you see these diversity of gifts, whether you want to think of them as terms of miraculous gifts or just ordinary everyday, I have talents, I can do certain things, you can do certain things. Use it. Whatever it is, use it to God's glory, to God's glory. Sometimes people, I, I wonder if they do things in the Lord's church um, so that they get their name on the, the overhead, you know, the, on the screen or in the church bulletin because the way they react when they're accidentally forgotten makes you think it's more about them getting glory than God getting glory. God gets the glory whether your name's on a screen or not. But, but what are we shooting for? See, we need to be careful about that. We need to be good stewards of God. And sometimes we have gifts that need stirring up. Have you ever had a drink that, that 
it, it settles at the bottom, and, and you have to stir it. Paul told Timothy he needed to stir up the gift that was given to him. And, and we need to stir it. And it's the same word for provoke. It literally means to stir. If you've had a sibling, you know what it means to provoke. You, you, you move them to something. You, you provoke them. You get, a, you get some kind of reaction out of somebody. And, and he's saying, you take the gift that you have been given and stir it. Don't let it just settle. Use it. And use it to the glory of God. I heard a preacher not too long ago, and he was preaching, and he had an air of arrogance. And as he was preaching, he got done, it was a kind of a class kind of setting, and he said, now, uh, is there anything that I haven't thought? And he just stopped himself like that. And he said, is there, and then he just restated it. Is there anything that you would like to add? You see, he almost said, is there anything that I didn't think of? And that would be humbling, because there was something he never thought of that somebody else might know. And so he stopped himself right in the middle of the word and then rephrased it and said, does anybody else have anything to say? God hates pride. You know, about 25 years or so ago, I was invited to speak on a lectureship with Thomas Warren, or Thomas Warren, uh, Tom Holland, excuse me, Tom Holland, and there was some other person, I don't remember who it is, and boy, I thought I had arrived. Tom Holland and I, me, we're going on this, and so we got to rub shoulders all week, and we rode in the same car, and we stayed in the same hotel, and I was, I was kind of just floating along, you know, that, that weekend, and it came time for uh, uh, the, the lessons, and it was a big place, there was 800 people or so there, and uh, the first time I preached, I preached to all those people, and I'm just feeling really good about myself, and then there was that time when we broke into groups. And Tom pre preached in the auditorium and I preached in a classroom across the hall. Two women showed up to my class. He had 798 and I had two. And I think they were looking for the restroom. But, but they had pity on me and stayed in that room and uh, all of a sudden I was back where I should be. I literally have told my wife, and I said this this morning, I've, I've told my wife, if you see a hint of arrogance and pride, you let me know. We're blind to it often. We don't see it in ourselves. And I do not want to be that guy. And, and what the Lord says is, you serve, use your talents. Listen, if you're a pie baker, bake pies and take it to the needy and give God the glory for it. Don't take the glory for yourself. Deflect and tell them that it's because you're a Christian, because you're a child of God. I had a friend one time who went to the, the store or to a car wash and as he was uh, walking, getting his quarters, he walked back and he saw another guy's quarters were about to run out and he wasn't near finished with his car. So he just stopped and he put a bunch of quarters in that guy's Thing. And that guy just stood there like stunned. He, he, he didn't know him, but he was doing that. And so he went on, washed his car. And when he finished, that man had not left. He was standing there by his stall. And he came up to him and said, do I know you? And he said, no. And he said, yeah, but you, you put quarters in my car wash. And he said, I know. I, I saw it was about to run out and you weren't near finished yet. And he said, why would you do that? And he said, because I'm a disciple of Jesus. And that man said, where do you go to church? And he said, to the church where I was preaching. And that man said, I'm going to come and visit you all. Just a simple act, putting quarters in a guy's car wash. If we will use the abilities and take advantage of the opportunities that we have, we can make tremendous change and have an impact in people's lives and give God the glory and not try to take it for ourselves. To sum it all up, I can't think of a better 
title for that section of scripture. It's another one of those nutshell passages. You know what it means to be a child of God? It means to look for the second coming of Jesus, to love and to serve one another. And that sounds a whole lot like love God and love your fellow man, the two greatest commands. Do we have an invitation tonight as well? Um, as we close tonight, I, I want you to consider your life with Christ. And if you have needs that you have been delaying putting off, maybe you need to obey the gospel. Maybe you need to take that step. You haven't yet. I want to remind you of this. Be watchful. The end of all things is at hand. There's nothing else left. I mean, this is it. What comes next is the return of Jesus. And if you haven't humbled yourself in obedience to him, I, I hope you'll do that tonight. And if you're a child of God already but unfaithful, and you need to give back to serving him and loving and serving your fellow man, we'll pray with you to that end if you'll come as we stand together and sing. Thank you for a tremendous, tremendous lesson. The exposition of that text was awesome. One of the things I've always appreciated about you so very much is your sincerity, the compassion you have on people. It's easy to listen to you because we know how much you love Jesus and how much you love all of us. And uh, that really showed tonight. And um, a lot of what you said tonight really helped me and changed me. So thank you. I hope all of you feel the same way that you'll be convicted about what was said from God's words, that we'll become better people. And uh, that's one of the things I love so much about Focal Point and opportunities to be together like this, to hear great lessons like this, is that it causes me to want to be better, to do better, and to serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. So thank you very much, Steve. I do have um, one apology that I want to make to you tonight. And uh, I've been saying something about you for a while that just hasn't been true. 
You know, Steve is, is rather tall. How tall are you, Steve? He's 6'6". Six, six. And I heard Steve tell a story, you know, that sometimes people come up to him because he's so tall, and this happens, the stereotypical kind of response to tall people is when they first see them, they go, oh, you're so tall, do you play basketball? And I had heard that Steve would say, as he looked down to this shorter person, no, do you play miniature golf? <laughs> but now I've got that story wrong because I heard tonight that you do, you did play basketball. So I, I've got it all wrong, and I apologize deeply for that. <laughs> so I'll try to tell that story a little more accurately next time. But anyway, it's, uh, what, what a great illustration, though, there, too, as well. Get out in the community, do those kinds of things, be around people and uh, to try to influence people in a good way. This particular series of lessons today, this wonderful series of, of lectures on helping preachers, but also helping all of us to live the Christian life has, has certainly influenced, I know, many people. And I have been excited to see uh, preachers from various places and members here of this congregation that have been attending uh, at various points throughout the day. And whether we have a few or many, it doesn't matter because we're helping people, we're encouraging people, and I just want to thank this congregation so much for their effort, for the work that they put into this, because we need to be building each other up. We need to be supporting people in ministry and those who, who serve in other capacities like you're doing here. This congregation has done a great job at that. And you're to be commended. Thank you for helping to help others in the kingdom of God. Now this is not over. We've got a great day tomorrow, and I hope that you'll take a look at the schedule because there are some wonderful things planned for us, starting with some great donuts at 8 o'clock, right? Josh, you're going to have those here at 8. Appreciate him doing that every morning. And then at 8.30, we have a, a trio of uh, speakers. The directors are getting together, and uh, tomorrow we'll be uh, delivering, uh, uh, each sharing a little bit of time talking about the uh, trio of responsibilities that we have in the church of evangelism, edification, and benevolence. So a good way to start off the day. And I don't know if you've looked at the schedule and uh, thought about the different things that are happening, but uh, everything from uh, deeper study sessions to women's sessions to limited uh, sessions where there's just room for a few people, kind of a more of an intimate setting, uh, so much going on. I hope you'll take a look at that. Leadership uh, issues being addressed tomorrow afternoon. So those of you that are elders who are thinking about becoming elders or who are in various leadership capacities in the church, please take advantage of all of that. Look who's speaking tomorrow. We've got a great lineup. Uh, Justin Guess and Aubrey Deaver and Bailey Jones and Jeff and Dale Jenkins. We've got Rick Brumbach and Eric Owens and Matt Gibson, Todd Creighton, Mike Vestal, and, uh, of course, Dan Winker will be speaking tomorrow night. And um, Patrick Hammock, I think I've mentioned most everybody that's going to be speaking. But don't forget on those limited sessions that we have uh, one with uh, Jeff and Dale. And that will be for elders and preachers and discussions. And then a couple there in the morning. And then two with Di Dan and Diane Winkler. Wow, what a great opportunity to, in a small setting, just sit and be able to talk and uh, receive some advice and information, just another component of all of this that I think makes this lectureship, this particular seminar or workshop so very unique. And then let's be back tomorrow night to be here and here, Brother Dan Winkler. And you know what we ought to do? We ought to just fill this building tomorrow night. How many people do you know that aren't here that we could just give them a call, encourage them, send them a text? We're real good at that these days. So let's do that. And let's encourage Dan. Let's encourage each other. Uh, being here for the singing, hearing the lesson tomorrow night by Brother Dan. Any other announcements that uh, I've overlooked? Okay. Let's uh, have our closing hymn, and then uh, John Matu will lead us in our closing prayer, and then after that we will be dismissed. Let's be standing, please, as we sing our song and for our closing prayer. Number 515. Number 515. <clears throat> On Zion's glorious summit stood a new rest so sweet he might love. They in their king in strange divine. I heard a song and strove to join. I heard the song and
Let us pray. Dear Father, we're so thankful for all the blessings, the mercy, the love, the grace you've given us. Thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to be here this week to study and learn from your word, from your son, and the example that he was to us. As we depart, help us to keep our minds focused on you, your word, your son, the examples. Keep us safe and help us to come back safely tomorrow. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.